In this inspiredinsider.com interview, we talk with Julie Clark. She's founder of Baby Einstein. She built a multi-million dollar business in her basement, and she's a two-time cancer survivor. Listen to the story of how she built it, how she beat cancer, and much more coming up right now. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm the founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have Julie Clark. Julie Clark is a full-time mom, former teacher, best known for founding the Baby Einstein Company in 1997. It was born in her basement and became a multi-million dollar company. In less than five years, was generating more than $20 million dollars and she sold the company to Disney in 2001. Just to give you an idea, one in three households with babies in the US own at least one Baby Einstein product, mine included, I have several. Um, Julie's a two-time cancer survivor, which is remarkable, which we're gonna dive into that, and an author of children's books that have sold more than 30 million copies. And her current projects can be found on mommymade.com, which include Happy Appy, which is a free app, you should definitely download it, and Baby Bites, which we'll get into later. Julie, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm really excited to talk to you, and I would like to include a fun fact about the guest. Fun fact about you is you've been to every continent, including Antarctica. How was Antarctica? Yes. Antarctica was really awesome. Actually, it's funny. You know, people go, what do you do there? And um, it was fun. I mean, we, we were on a ship. We, we traveled with National Geographic. And um, I've really committed myself to doing lots of travel with my kids. So our kids have been on literally every trip I can think of that we've gone on, at least big trips. Um, and so Antarctica was awesome. Lots of penguins. Penguins, <laughs> nice. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, they talk about they go through tough times, a lot of things standing in their way, which is personal issues, money, health. And the question is, how do we overcome some of these things that seem insurmountable obstacles? And you've done both in business and personal. We want to hear about that. But first, tell us, obviously, you shaped a lot of lives early on with Baby Einstein. What shaped you from an early age? You know, I think that I was fortunate to have parents who stayed married, (laughs) which is pretty remarkable, right? Um, I have great parents, and they were really key in making sure that I always knew that I had goals. So I knew from a very young age that I was going to college. And I would have, I was, in fact, the first person in my family to go to college. So um, in terms of extended cousins and extended family, um, nobody else had gone. But my mom and dad knew that was what they wanted for me. And so it was sort of without question that that was something I would do. And so I really had that goal in mind. I also was an enormous reader. Um, I love reading still. I grew up in a pretty quiet household where my parents both read a lot and read to me and with me and listened to me read things that I wrote to them. And um, I think that that was key. I think that, you know, it's funny. I recently listened to an interview by a woman who's written a book about introverts. I think it's called Quiet. and. Um, it's, it's remarkable. I really, you know, I am an introvert, which is funny because I do lots of public speaking now. Yeah. But I think that there's something to be said for that quiet time where you actually are alone and thinking and living in your mind to a degree because the imagination allows us to grow and change and believe. And mm-hmm. it's pretty cool. So I think that was great. I know one of your big priorities was to be a stay-at-home mom, be with your kids, and you got that. What were your, what did your parents do? Well, unfortunately, my mom was not able to be a stay-at-home mom um, because she had to work. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot of money. My dad was an electrician. My mom did stay home with me, actually, for the first seven years of life, which was wonderful. And then she went back to work full-time. Um, and so, you know, at that age... It was funny, you know, I mean, this was to date myself in the early 70s, and it didn't seem so unsafe to kind of leave a child, let a child come home from school and let herself in the house, that whole latchkey 
kid thing. Right. Um, so yeah, so my mom was home with me when she could be, and then did go back to work. Yeah. And so I remember hearing you say one of your dad's sayings that, that you bring, you know, bring with you. Do you remember that saying that affected you that he used to say? Uh, Gosh, I can't think of what it was. It, it was, um, it. he said, um, don't do anything half-assed. Oh, <laughs> that's right. That's so funny. I can't believe you read that. That's funny. <laughs> So when did he tell you that? Because that's really influenced you in how you built your company. <laughs> that is funny. Yeah, you know, I grew up believing that you can't do anything half-assed. If you're going to commit to something, you really need to commit to it. My husband says it too. He says it all the time to our daughters. And it's a funny thing that um, I do find myself living by. You know, if, if you're going to really commit to something, then you really need to do it. Um, I, do, I do have to admit that the only time I feel half-assed is if I start, if I pick up a book and I don't like it, I will put it down and never read it again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I do find myself sort of picking and choosing what I'm going to commit to. But I feel that in particular, when you're really passionate about something, that's when it's easy to commit, mm -hmm. you know, because you believe in it. You really want it to happen. Was there a time early on with the company, uh, obviously you started in your basement that you those words rang in your head that don't do something half-assed that you had to kind of overcome or was it just easy because you had just a fuel inside you to do it well I think it was once I decided I mean the truth is like a lot of startups it was something baby Einstein was something that I conceived of and thought about for quite a while before I really started to do something about it mm -hmm. and so I wouldn't say that that meant I was doing it half-assed. I kind of wasn't doing it at all. I was just thinking about it until I decided to do it. And then once I decided to do it, yeah, I mean, absolutely, it rang in my head. If you're going to do it, do it and do it right. And I think that many times people, um, I see it all the time with people who are, who are managing startups, they'll try to get by without doing everything really well because often they're worried about the finances or they don't have the ability to do it well because they don't, they're not skilled in it. Um, I would say that one of the things that really made Baby Einstein successful, as well as the other startups that I've worked on, is that I really made sure that it was quality. It was what I would want, right? So mm. in particular, because I was making something for children, and I think that when you're making something for children, parents really want it to be good. You don't want it to be junky. Right. So I knew that I needed the music to be high quality, beautiful music. And that for me was tricky because that was the most expensive part, at least when I started Baby Einstein, was I could do much of it myself and do it with a really beautiful high quality, but I, I'm not a musician, so I needed to hire somebody for that. And at the time, I remember sitting down with my husband and saying, what do you think? I mean, we could maybe get some old recordings or something in the public domain and we came to the decision that it couldn't be that. It really had to be very special and that it couldn't be half-assed. Yeah. I mean, what made you decide to even bring it to the market? Because I know you were feeling a need for your kids. You wanted, what made you decide, oh, you know what, I really want to get this out to everyone? Well, two things. I mean, first and foremost, I'm a teacher. And so I love the idea. When I first went into teaching, when I decided to become a teacher, and I was an English teacher for a few years before I left school to have my daughter, um, you know, when you really love something, you want to share it. And you hope that you can create the same love in somebody else. And so when I became an English teacher, I hoped that I could create that same love for poetry, for example, in my students. And so with Baby Einstein, it was similar. It was like, okay, I'm making this, and I know it's going to be great for my daughter, and I know there's nothing else in the marketplace like this that exposes kids to this kind of really incredible music that I love so much. So there was that component. And then on top of that, the realistic part is that I was starting to invest personal money, right? I was investing my own finances. I didn't yeah. borrow any money. And when you start investing your own money, there's that nervousness quality of, shoot, you know, I really need to make sure that I want to get it back. the money I'm investing, I at least make <laughs> it back. Even if I don't make a million dollars, at least I can earn back what I've spent. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I mean, obviously people see it from the outside and go, oh, you know, baby Einstein, success, success, success. But what were some of the big, you know, it wasn't always that easy. What were some of the big roadblocks you hit with the business that you had to overcome? Well, initially, the biggest roadblock was how am I going to get this into the market? You know, at the time I was living in Georgia, I was a um, stay at home mom. I had been a teacher, I had no marketing experience whatsoever. I had a product that I knew was great and I believed in it, and I really thought it could be successful. But I was now stuck with a product that I knew, again, all these things about. But how was I going to get that to other people? And that is, of course, everybody asks that question. People, right. entrepreneurs, always say, I have this great thing, how am I going to get it out there? And um, so for me, what I did, and that was the, the first big roadblock, I decided to go to a trade show. And I'd never been to a trade show, but I thought, okay, this is, this is where I can find a buyer for my product. And um, I didn't even have a booth at that trade show for one reason, because I'd never been to a trade show and I didn't know that a booth was required. <laughs> the other reason is that um, I probably couldn't have afforded a booth, even if I had They're probably that. expensive, yeah. Yes, they are. So I went to that trade show with my videos, which were at the time in VHS form, and walked around that trade show looking for a particular buyer. I knew where I wanted my product to be, and that was at a store called The Right Start, which is where I shopped for my own baby. And um, on the second day, I did find a buyer from The Right Start, and I was, you know, so excited. I found somebody. I knew that this was the perfect product for them. And so I pretty much charged her and got the video in her hand. And um, that was very exciting. I knew I'd gotten it in her hand and I'd been able to give her like the one minute pitch about what it was. So what did you say? Important. What, did you, what was the one minute pitch? What did you tell her? I think the one minute pitch was, and, you know, of course I was just so excited I, I found her. It probably sounded like this. Oh my God, I love your store. I shop at your store all the time for my baby. It's the greatest store. And guess what? I have the perfect product for your store. I made this and it is just exactly what the right start needs. There's nothing like it in the marketplace. I'm a mom of a new baby. I know moms with new babies who would love this. It's classical music for babies. It's completely unique and it has the greatest name, Baby Einstein. You really, really, really must have this in your store. I think that was something like what it sounded like. <laughs> <laughs> so then what was another roadblock? So obviously, where was the actual trade show? It was in New York. Okay. So, so you, went from, I, you just went on a whim from Georgia to New York just to find this one or two people that you can actually get this in the hands of. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, so I went to New York. Um, the trade show's at the Javits Center. There's, 20, there's about 20,000 people who attend Toy Fair. So... That was remarkable and unexpected. Again, I had never been to a trade show, so I had no idea how enormous this was going to be. Um, and yeah, that was that was pretty important and something. Again, I tell people all the time: you need. To, how do you get in front of your buyers? And so for me, that was important. Now, you know, it's a little bit skewed because the marketplace has changed so much from the time that I launched Baby Einstein, right, which was 1997. In 1997, there really was no internet. I mean, people didn't communicate via email, and we didn't go online and buy things from Amazon. So it was a different market. People still shopped in stores um, to a much greater degree than they do now. And so I'm not, it's, and, and, you know, I, I will say, and, and we can talk about this later, I've run in, into some different roadblocks in this new marketplace with the new businesses that I've been working with. So what's, uh, so? actually? yeah, you could talk about that now. What is one roadblock you've hit now that you didn't see before? Well, um, one thing, of course, is that people shop online so much. And so the glut of product available online is enormous. Uh, for example, we have a company, a new company called Baby Bites and it's B-Y-T-S, and Baby Bites makes predominantly apps, um, and the app store is flooded with something like, I, I'm, I'm not gonna get the number right, I wanna say it's you know 20,000 new apps a day, it's ridiculous. Wow. How do you rise out of the noise of that yeah. to become something that people recognize and see? For us, what we did and have been doing, and it's been fairly successful so far, 
is that it comes back to that quality. So there have been four instances now, and we just launched our first app, Lullabites, in June, and we have had on four occasions um, the top slot in the App Store for best new apps. Oh, wow. And that's because our app is the best. And so how do you rise above? Well, you have to produce the best product. It has to be excellent. It has to stand out either because it's the best, it has to have a great catchy name, which can be a roadblock. I mean, I talk to people often that have a great company idea, but the name, if say it's called, you know, WD Enterprises, I have no idea what they do. You've come up you with know, some they, good they, names. Yeah. Yeah. Baby yeah, Einstein. Have, so how did you come up with Baby Einstein and know I can use Einstein's name? Was there any issue with that? Oh, yes, there was. Um, my ignorance was wonderful because I had never started a company and I didn't understand trademark or copyright laws or anything like that. So I sat in my kitchen when I was in the process of creating that first Baby Einstein video and I thought, what would be a great name? You know, I knew that it was a product for babies, so I should have baby in the name. And I knew what ultimately I wanted it to do, which was, you know, be the best product and be stimulating and, you know, have amazing music and just be full of curiosity and wonder. And the person who emulated that the most for me was Albert Einstein, who not only was, you know, sort of the greatest physicist ever, but who also played the violin and says, you know, creativity, who just talked and talked about creativity and imagination. So the name made perfect sense to me. The funny part is that my husband, who's actually a physics major, came home from his job the day that I'd drawn that logo, which I have to say I'm so proud of, is still the same logo that appears on Baby Einstein wow. products everywhere. And I drew that at my kitchen table, um, the little head and everything. And um, he, I told him, I said, I, I think we should call this Baby Einstein. And he's like, what? You can't call this Baby Einstein. I mean, Einstein was, you know, and he, he had this whole speech about Einstein. <laughs> well, I stuck to my guns and I said, no, this is perfect. You don't understand. Most people are not physics majors. <laughs> Most people are, and, and I'm trying to appeal to moms, right? And, and mm -hmm. moms and dads, like, they look for that for their child. Yeah. And so this is the perfect name. And um, ultimately, we did end up running into some issues um, two years into the company's success, which was growing and changing and, and just becoming amazing. Um, and we now had three products in the market, which were Baby Einstein, Baby Mozart, and Baby Bach. Um, we received a letter from a lawyer, as you can imagine, that was not well received, um, that said, hey, guess what? You can't use the name Baby Einstein. And I was so sad because, first of all, it was the greatest name ever. And secondly, because I had a product now, I, I was, you know, I was running up the numbers and people knew it and recognized it and were talking about it and how could I possibly change it? And so long story short, we negotiated with our lawyer and this other lawyer. This other lawyer represented the Hebrew University of Jerusalem hmm. who owns actually Albert Einstein's final papers. And you know, in the end, it makes sense. I don't mind actually donating money to the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. I mean, it's an amazing school. Um, and it's where Einstein would have wanted money to go. And so when I looked at it that way, it made sense to me. So we negotiated. It was expensive. Um, fortunately, we had had success. And so we were, we were able and willing to make that donation to the university. So it worked out. Yeah, yeah, because it is a good name. You want to keep it. It uh, is. <laughs> what were, were there any other challenges when you were getting, where you're growing? Like with, um, you, you have to start hiring or you have to increase the amount of, you know, videos or distribution. What, what roadblocks should sure. people watch out for with that? Well, um, we were really lucky because our business was so self-contained. So for the first three years, we literally worked in our basement and we had four employees. It was myself, my husband, a woman who answered the phone, who was a friend and neighbor and um, a guy that we hired who had been distributing our product in Japan and wanted to move back to the US and he was just the perfect hire for us. We still work with him, Jeff Matei. And um, so we worked literally out of my basement 
and then we moved into some office space, very small office space. The reality for us for hiring those first five years that we owned the company was that we only had five employees at the time that we sold the company to Disney. So yeah. I can't even speak to hiring because it was remarkable and ridiculous. In our fifth year, we did over $20 million in sales wow. and we had five employees. It was crazy. And a couple of people that we contracted with, like our musician and a video editor. But it was wonderful. I mean, we were just tiny and it was great. And we worked with people that we knew and loved. So the really big challenge came when that fifth year hit and we were growing like mad and we realized that to maintain our growth we were really going to need to hire more people and we were going to really need to ramp up our business so we were going to um, you know have to make more product we loved what we did I mean when I made a video it was like creating a baby I mean it was I mean it was the no sex of course but um, we were, <laughs> we For were inspiration only. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> from conception of the idea to everything that went into it, whether it was you know designing the puppets that were going to go on my hand, to selecting the toys that were going to be a part of the video, to choosing the music, to working with the musician and the sound editor, and it was just so great. It was like creating something really new and beautiful, and that was going to have to go away when we grew. We knew that because we just there was no way we could maintain that slow pace of the nine months, say, that it took to, to create and grow a baby mm. was going to have to go by the wayside. And I wasn't really wanting to give that up. I knew that I couldn't make products that were going to mean as much to me if I had to make them really quickly. So we sat down, my husband and I, and we said, okay, what, you know, we have sort of two choices here. We can do that. We can grow and we can add all of these people and we can make a product that isn't the perfect product for us anymore. Or we can kind of count our blessings and say, huh, we could sell this company. We knew Disney would be interested because they were already licensing the name for books from us. And we figured we could go to them and say, hey, we want to sell. Are you interested? And we were pretty sure they'd say yes. Um, so we made that decision. We decided to allow the baby to move to college and, um, and we did and we sold the company and that was a hard decision and it remained a hard, it remained something that was a little bit hard to live with for quite a while after really? the fact. What was hard about it afterwards? Well, you know, when we first negotiated the sale and made the sale, I signed an employment agreement with Disney and I assumed that I would be consulting with Disney a whole heck of a lot and still be really deeply involved in creating the product. And what happened, which is really the story of many entrepreneurs, is that the big company wasn't so interested anymore in hearing what the little guy had to say. And so the company grew and it changed and that was very hard to watch. So it turned out that it wasn't as if my baby grew up and went to college. It was more like my baby grew up, got on an alien spaceship, and went to another planet. <laughs> that was how differently the company was run after I sold really? it. Really? It was hard to watch. You know, I mean, I, I loved it. It was, it was part of my heart, and, um, and it changed a lot. But... In some ways, in some ways for the good, and in some ways for ways that I wouldn't have done it. Yeah. So. I mean, I watched you give a talk, and one of the interesting parts that you said about hiring, which I thought was really important, was you didn't just hire these people and pay them a wage. You actually gave them stake in the company, right? Yes. And I yes. think that's really important to talk about. How did you make that decision, and how do you decide how much to give an employee? Well, for us, it was really based on the amount of time that they were going to be investing in the company. Um, you know, we have, we just believe that you want people to work for you who are committed to your goals and your ideas and your dreams. We had all parents working for us, which was great because they were parents of young children. They got it. They knew what we were all about. And that was key. So we had moms answering the phone. So if a mommy called and said, you know, I've got this baby Mozart video and it's the only thing that would, you know, that is helping my baby to stop crying when he's teething, but he broke the video last night and I don't know what I'm going to do. 
we would just send out another video. We right. didn't say, oh, you know, call this person and we're sorry, you have to go to the store and, you know, we would literally just do the right thing, which was right. send her another video. And it didn't, it didn't hurt our business, it helped our business because then that word of mouth was so incredible for us. Um, so yes, I would say definitely hire people that are committed. And then if you give them a stake, and I'm not saying exactly how much of a stake, it's sort of, I think everybody's situation is different. Um, when we sold the company, we were able to give a substantial amount of money to the people who had been so key for us. So Jeff, for example, who had been our sales and marketing director, um, got a really substantial chunk of money, which we were happy to give. He deserved it. Right. He worked for us so hard. And the, the gentleman who does our music still and who did our music then, we were able to give him a large share. The person who did all of our video editing, we gave him a ton of equipment, which was wonderful for him, right? I mean, that was sort of like free money. Um, I just want to say that, you know, I can't really give numbers, but it's, I just think it's so key to give people a stake. They will believe yeah. in you more and invest in the business more. Yeah, I ask because I think it's a really smart idea. Someone has ownership and feels ownership yeah. in the company and someone listening may be like, well, I don't even know where to start. Where do you begin? How do I how much should I give them or what the case is? Do you have any tips for them on what to look at to figure that out for themselves? I mean, obviously you did what was right for you and, and your employees and your company and everyone's going to be different, but where should they even start? Yeah, well, I want to say, that, you know, and I'm probably still not answering your question right, but I want to say that one thing that we learned is that you should always Find out what people expect and then give them more because it means so much to somebody. If it's somebody who's even babysitting for your children, um, you know, and they think they're going to make $8 an hour and you give them $12 an hour, it was like nothing to you really, but it meant so much to them that they're going to do a good job for you. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the amount... I'm, you know, I hate to, it's I hate just, to be uh, flaky on this I'm not a good person to ask. That's Honestly, funny. truly, and I and I hate to like kind of pass the buck, but I'm going to. My husband does the CFO stuff, and so I'm I'm not a good person to ask. That's fine. That Sorry about that. No. So I was talking to a friend, fellow entrepreneur, um, Bradley Will, this morning, and I want to know. I I said I'm gonna have this inspiring entrepreneur on. What do you think I should ask him? What would you want to know? And he wanted to know how you would grow as a person, how you grew as a person as the business grew. What were some defining moments for you that made you step out of your comfort zone? Well, gosh, speaking in front of people was so hard for me. It was really funny, a little story that is kind of cool. And, it, and it, I think it's important for people to recognize as well. Sometimes you have to take a chance. So, for example, going to Toy Fair, that was taking a big chance for me. I, I'd never done anything like that before, but I was really passionate about what I was doing, and so I believed I could do it. But another funny story is that um, early on, I hadn't yet sold, I'd gone to Toy Fair, I hadn't yet um, sold a single video, though, because they hadn't yet put it in stores or tried it out. I was living in Atlanta, and one day, I just said, the only way people are going to know about this is if I can somehow get some media to talk about it. How am I going to do that? So again, I'm living in Georgia and literally, you know, 20 minutes away from me in Atlanta is CNN. So I thought, well, I should call CNN. I, again, I don't know anything about this. I've never done an interview in my life. I call CNN. I get the, you know, person at the receptionist and I said, Hi, this is Julie Clark. I'm the founder of the Baby Einstein Company, which is hardly even a company at the time. I have not sold one product. I said, um, you know, I have a product that's perfect for a parenting story. And she said, oh, well, let me connect you to the parenting department. I'm on the phone. I'm like, really? So I get this woman on the phone. She answers right away. Her name is Pat. And I said, hi, Pat. This is Julie Clark. I live in Atlanta. I'm really just down the road from you, and I know you cover parenting. And I have this beautiful product, and I go on to explain what Baby Einstein is. And lo and behold, she says, wow, that's incredible. I'm doing a story right now on Romanian orphans and how the lack of stimulation in their life, in the first 12 months of their life, 
impacts their lives later and how it changes because they're not receiving proper stimulation. It would be so great if I could interview you so that I could show the difference in lack of stimulation and children who are, you know, beautifully stimulated. Mm. Can I come over tomorrow and interview you for the story? I'm like, ah, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> So like now I'm like madly cleaning my house. I can't believe it. I've got CNN coming to the house tomorrow. I was actually pregnant with my second daughter at the time. And that was just a great, I think it's a great story to show that sometimes you do have to step out of your comfort zone. Now it's not always going to work out. That was a remarkable. That's pretty remarkable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. But I do tell people, and I think it's really important because sometimes people have said to me, oh, you're so lucky. You're so lucky. You're so lucky. And I feel, yeah, I have been lucky, but you know what? You do make your own luck. Mm -hmm. I would not have been lucky if I hadn't made that phone call. Right. I would not have been lucky if I hadn't gone to that trade show. Right. So sometimes you do need to step out of the box and do things that make you a little uncomfortable. And I had them come to the house, and I watched that interview now, that CNN interview, which makes me sometimes a little weepy because my oldest daughter, who's now in college, is two in the video and you know in the in this interview and she's so darling and I'm pregnant with my second daughter who's now sixteen. And um but I look at it and I'm like, wow, I didn't know how to do an interview at all. I was a total novice. But you know, you learn and you grow and you change and I feel so much more comfortable now in that respect. And I think that I've spent a lot of time since having success with Baby Einstein doing philanthropic things and I've really learned it's not all about me, right? I mean you you learn and you change that that center of yourself where you feel for a long time and, and this is part of being young too, I think, everything is about you and it's really not. And so I want to say that I feel like I've grown so much in that regard. In that that understanding that giving back is so much bigger than anything you can do for yourself in your own little world. So Yeah. I mean, early on, we're in survival mode. We're just trying to kind of put food on the table and make ends meet. And then as we kind of climb up, you want to give back. And, and totally. yeah, no, I understand that. And, and that's what I, one of the reasons I ask these questions is because it's people from the outside see, oh, it's lucky. This person just hit it big. But the reality is not many people would have even... They would have just maybe used it for, wouldn't have created anything, but you created something and not only you to use it for your kids, but you got it out there. And then you just on a whim go to New York with 20,000 people around and try and find that person. So there's a lot of challenges and roadblocks along the way. And in addition to that, one of the biggest things I want to talk to you about is you, what's even more remarkable than baby Einstein, if there is, if that's possible, is the challenges you've faced personally and what you've overcome in that regard. Um, what... What happened? Tell people what happened in, in 2004. So, 2004, um, I had sold Baby Einstein at the end of 2001, and I spent a good year and a half or so just enjoying my new retirement. Um, we traveled a lot, spent a lot of time with the kids. And then, as my children were now in elementary school, and I started thinking about different things that I wanted to do, I realized that I child safety was really important to me because my own kids were becoming, you know, a little bit more independent. They were spending time at friends' homes and things like that. So I decided to make a product called the Safe Side, which is I can talk more about later. But but the reason I'm talking about this now is just to say that 2004, I'm in the midst of this new startup company called the Safe Side and I'm doing great and I'm feeling wonderful and I'm working out and my health is perfect and um, I've got this new company that's really exciting for me and I'm in the midst of editing this first Safe Side video and I'm at the studio working with my video guy and I had been um, working out the day before and my muscles were really sore from working out and I think this is important because I, I want people to be aware always of how you find things like this. I'm rubbing under my arm because I'm really sore and suddenly I find this tiny little lump and I'm like, what the hell is that? I've never felt anything like that before. So I go to the doctor, long story, longer, um, I'm diagnosed with breast cancer. Oh. I can't believe it. I'm 37, 
My children are six and eight, and this can't be happening to me. I'm young, I'm healthy, I don't have a family history, um, and of course I'm thrown into absolute darkness. Um, in the midst of this amazing, beautiful life that has just rolled out so perfectly for me, I am just thrown into the darkness that breast cancer means. And um, so I consult with a handful of doctors. I make a pretty big decision, a bold decision. I decide to have a double mastectomy, wow. which is considered really extreme at the time because I'm diagnosed with stage one cancer, which is the good kind of cancer. Yeah. Um, there is, yeah, such a thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, the cancer's small, it hasn't invaded any lymph nodes, and I decide this can never happen to me again. I'm having a double mastectomy, which I do, and I go through it, and I, you know, a year later, I'm back on track. I've got no evidence of disease in my body. I'm feeling great, and I get back to work. And um, everything is great. We do amazing stuff. We homeschool our kids. We're spending all this time with family. And four and a half years later, in 2008, I'm diagnosed a second time. Um, the second time is the bad kind, the worst kind, because not only is the breast cancer back, but it has moved into my lymph nodes and wow. also into my liver. Wow. So stage four cancer is really the worst kind because there is no stage five. So now I'm thrown into utter darkness and um, I really have to say that I didn't I didn't know what that was going to mean for me. I mean, when you ask a doctor about stage four cancer, you are considered terminal. And 95% of people, given the diagnosis I was given, pass away within two years. Really? Oh so my gosh. My, yeah, so my girls are now 12 and 14, and um, our family is thrown into this terrible time. And after living in that darkness for, you know, a while. Um, I just, well, initially, after the first month after that diagnosis, I decided I'm going to do everything I can to fight this. And I try, I do my best to fill myself with hope. And um, Yeah, what I, do you do? How do you get out of the darkness? I mean, people listening to this, they may be going through this right now or have a family member. Yeah. How do you even climb out of that when a doctor gives you a a timeline like that. What do you do? Yeah. Well, for me, I spent a lot of time reading and educating myself to the best of my ability. Now, reading can be really scary too because most of the stories you read are not good stories. Right. But you know, there are a handful of stories out there that are the good stories, that are right. the people who are doing well, which thank God I am now. And so that's why I think it's important to tell this story. Um, you know, I tried to look for people who were doing well. I asked doctors, who do you know who's been given this diagnosis that is living with it still after two years, beyond mm -hmm. five years? You know, and so I, I was able to find those people and reach out to those people. And when you do find them, and as you know, you, you interviewed the gentleman who started in Women's yeah. Angels. Right. I mean, you look for people who have been through this, who can relate to you and understand you, and you reach out to them. Yeah. So hopefully I'm one of those people now that right. people can reach out to me. And um, so I did everything I could back to sort of the health part. I did chemotherapy. I did more surgery. I had my ovaries removed. I did lots and lots of things that were required to keep myself on a path. And six months after that stage four diagnosis, I went in and had another PET scan. And I was diagnosed free of cancer, including wow. the cancer that was all over my liver. And I had had an oncologist actually tell me at the time that I was diagnosed, he said, or she said, you have so many tumors on your liver, they will never all go away. Wow. I mean, like, I don't even know as a human being how you can say those words to somebody, which offers them no hope. Right. So I basically, I won't say the words that I said in my mind to her because they're very foul words that we wouldn't want the baby Einstein lady to say. But they were pretty good I think words. we can imagine, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, I have been cancer-free for four and a half years. Congratulations. I That's amazing. Thank you. I yeah. continue to have PET scans every six months. 
I say a lot of prayers. I thank people for a lot of prayers. I am um, feel great. I'm doing well. Um, and one thing that was really terrific that I was able to do, because I think this is also really important in terms of the philanthropy part, is because I know how to write for children, and I've written a lot of books for children, the Baby Einstein, all the Baby Einstein books, I decided to write a book that would be applicable to mommies or daddies who have cancer and who need to give that story to their children. Yeah. So there is nothing I can think of in the world that is harder than talking to your children about having cancer because the fear is so great, not only in you that you're going to have to leave your children, but the fear in your children that they're going to lose their mommy. It's horrible. So I thought, okay, I know how to write books for children. So I wrote a beautiful picture book. It's called You Are the Best Medicine. And basically it's a story where a mommy is sitting down with her child and she's telling them what cancer treatment will look like. So I'm going to you know, have to take this medicine and it's going to make me lose my hair and it's going to make me feel sick. And she kind of goes through these things. But all along the way, she's telling her child how important that child's love is while mommy is going through this treatment. And it's beautiful and it's perfect to sit down with your children and read this book. And 100% of the proceeds from the book go to breast cancer research. Wow. So in particular, there's a doctor at UCLA, even though I'm here in Colorado, there's a doctor at UCLA, Dennis Slayman, who does the most incredible breast cancer research. So I've been able to donate 100% of my proceeds from the book to him, wow. which has been great. So, you know, it's part of this whole give back. And I have to say that one thing I'm so proud of is that not only have I been able to give money to the cause, I've been able to give products to people based on this innate skill that I found out I have, which is I'm really good at making things for babies. Yeah. So it's, That's, thank you for sharing yeah. that. That's not an easy thing. And I have two questions about that. One is within that six months, that's a remarkable turnaround. What did you think made the biggest difference? And two, before you had, you didn't have this book when you told your kids, how did, how did you navigate that with your children? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, so in terms of talking to my own children, um, the first time was easier because they were younger. And, you know, I think that you tell kids what they can handle and what they can understand. Mm -hmm. So I was able at that time, and again, I was stage one the first time, to say, mommy has cancer, and you know that that's a sickness, and there are people who die from cancer, but I don't have the kind that, that you die from. I felt pretty confident saying that. Mm. The second time around, when they were older, 12 and 14, it was harder. Both of them knew people, knew, had friends actually, who'd had parents who died from cancer. Wow. So they knew, they really knew that this was a big deal. I will say that I did not tell my children that I had stage four cancer, not because I didn't think that they would understand, I think they could understand what that meant, but the truth is I didn't want them to have that understanding. I didn't want them to know if they went online, which they probably would have done if I said stage four cancer, mm -hmm. that 95% of these mommies died from stage four cancer. Mm -hmm. I needed them to hope and believe, and so I didn't, I didn't say it. I don't know if that was right or wrong. It was what worked for me. Right. Everybody has their own way of dealing with it. So I have friends who did tell their children from the beginning, and their children dealt with it the way that they dealt with it. It's so personal, Jeremy, that yeah. there is no right way. Um, in terms of how I made it through that six months, I just really advocated for myself. And that's something that people have to do. And if you can't do it, if you're an older person watching this interview and maybe you're not, you don't have the skills, say you don't have a computer, or you don't know how to navigate through all of the information, you need to find somebody who can help you, so a friend who can help you. Yeah. Because doctors are wonderful for the most part, um, but doctors have a lot of patients. And and I don't mean patients with a C, I mean patients with a T. Right. Um, you know, they have a lot of people that they care for. 
And if they see you for 20 minutes every few months or weeks, you're just one of a lot of people they're seeing. But you care about yourself more than anybody else is going to care about you. It's just the reality. So you have to find your way through that information. That was so hard for me because here I was, an English major. I haven't had biology since 10th grade and suddenly I'm online and I'm reading articles and I'm looking at research that has words like metastasis and words like, you know, I, I'm just reading things that I haven't read about in my life and now I have to educate it's myself. It's a whole new vocabulary, yeah. Right, yeah, and you're panicked and you're scared. You're scared as hell. I mean, this is really hard. You think you're going to die, but on top of that, you want to make sure that you're taking all the right steps. Yeah. Now, in terms of those steps, cancer is its own little beast that lives in different people in different ways. So the treatment that worked for me may not work for other people. I've had friends that I've lost who did the exact same treatment, who passed away. Why it worked for me and not somebody else, God only knows. Cancer, I, I look at cancer as a different creature inside those of us that it lives inside of. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, what works for some, some people go a holistic route and it works beautifully for them and it doesn't work for other people. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it's really tricky too because somebody like, you look at Steve Jobs who couldn't have had better resources or more intelligence or more people looking out for him and yet he passed away from this disease it wasn't because he didn't do everything he could have done for him so you do what's right for you and you you hope that it's the right thing and if you have faith you pray and if you um, you know have other people who have faith you ask them to pray I mean that yeah. you know that's part of that was part of my healing it's not part of what's right for everybody yeah I mean what, what do you think made the biggest difference for you whether it's mentally, what were you thinking throughout? Because it sounds like from the very beginning, you were thinking, I'm going to beat this. I mean, that was your yeah. mentality. And if they said anything different about there's an extra, you know, more tumors in your liver, you internally were like, you know, F, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Right. I'm an optimist. I mean, I'm an optimistic person. And um, I think that that's a necessity for entrepreneurs anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be. And, um, so I believe that you can, you know, I believe that there are people who beat the odds. And I just thought, I can look at this one of two ways. I can either beat it, I can believe I'm going to beat it, or I can believe I'm going to die. Yeah. So I'm going to believe I'm going to beat it. Yeah. I mean, that worked for me. I have this, it's on my desk. I'll just show it to you. It's yeah. like this beautiful little, little piece of metal that I love. And so... There are four sides to it, right? So I'm going to read it to you. One side says, yes, you are. One side says, yes, you do. One side says, yes, you can. And one side says, yes, you will. And I just think it's perfect. I have it on my desk. I just mm -hmm. like every day I go, yes, you will. You will. So you will beat this. You will do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you look at everything as it is and some of us have to face our mortality a little bit earlier than the rest of us but mm. somebody said to me once look life is a terminal condition right I mean you're born right. you die <laughs> right. it's terminal I mean it's never a permanent phase it's life and then it's death so mm. hopefully when you're here you can do all the good you can yeah thanks for sharing that that's and I love those four sayings um, yeah. I have Two more questions. I know we're right at the hour, so if you have to go, then I'll wrap it up. I don't know if you have time for those two. I've got or... like, let's go like 10, 15 more okay, minutes. Okay, great. Um, you know, there's just so much I want to ask you here, but uh, I know you uh, are a busy lady. So um, one of the biggest things, you know, coming from that, um, I wanted to hear about what's been one of the proudest moments. And we talk about a lot of these challenges and low points. For you in personal, personal or business, what's been a proud moment for you? The proudest moment is uh, two. It exists of the number two, which is my girls. I have the most incredible children. I know every mommy thinks that. I'm sure you think the same thing because you're a daddy. But um, I, have, I have to say that I've become, I think, a really good business person. I'm really proud of the achievements that I've had as a business person. I am more proud of being a great mom. I think I'm a great mom. I mean, I, I have to pat myself on the back sometimes and go, 
I've done a really great job. I don't know um, why or how I did that. I think I just have loved it so much. And in terms of, you know, you asked earlier about milestones and, and difficult times. Yeah. Man, the growing up of kids is really hard. You know, my oldest went to college this year, and despite the fact that she's only a half an hour away, um, that's been really hard for me. You know, it's a milestone where there is a sense of loss, of losing. Um, even though they're growing and, and still remarkable people, when they grow up, it's really tricky. They're not just right there with you anymore. And mm -hmm. God, that time flies by. Um, but I think proudest moments, gosh, I, you know, I was honored at the State of the Union address um, by President Bush, and that was incredible to sit behind Laura Bush in a box with the most amazing leaders and people who had done incredible things and be honored for my work as an entrepreneur and a cancer survivor. And by the way, I always like the word assassin, so I prefer cancer assassin. Got it. It's a little bit more strong than cancer survivor. <laughs> so I assassinated that beast. Right, right. Um, You're empowered so, with assassinating. I, yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, um, so I have to say, being at that State of the Union was pretty, I was pretty proud. And this is kind of funny because it sounds so silly, but a couple months ago I was contacted by the show Jeopardy, a producer at the show Jeopardy. And I had to sign permission for them to use the Baby Einstein logo in really? a Jeopardy question. Oh, wow. How cool is That's that? That's pretty cool. I watch Jeopardy every night with my daughters, and it's like, this is so cool. Like, this little logo that I drew was actually on Jeopardy. That was awesome. So I was pretty proud of that. I love that. <laughs> I want to hear, because oh. you do mention a couple things about, this you know. one of my helpers. Oh office by the way she just jumped up on I read on your website too there, there's chickens cats dogs yeah. fish right yes <laughs> so is that true you have chickens Lots of creatures I love my animals I'm a huge I'm a huge pet person I mean you have balance a lot and being a mom to you is very important how did you what's a typical day what's a typical day like for you well now it's a lot different of course because my girls are either at college or 16. Mm -hmm. My 16 year old drives herself to school so um, a typical day though I mean so I haven't talked about Happy Abby which is my new really super fun awesome awesome I don't know just startup I don't even want to really call it a startup it's not really a startup it's just a thing so um, let me talk about that and then I'll tell you how that impacts my day. Yeah. So. I decided to make an app um, and release it on the five-year anniversary of being diagnosed with stage four cancer. So that day, which was October 7th in 2008, the day I was diagnosed, was the darkest day of my life, right? I've never experienced a darker day than that. And I thought, five years in, no evidence of disease, I'm doing so great, I want to share the happiest. I want to share happiness with the world. And how can I share that happiness? So I decided to make an app that I've called Happy Appy. And just the name makes you smile, right? Happy Appy. You always come up with these catchy ones your mommy made. It sounds, <laughs> right? it just flows. Happy Appy. Yeah, I like it. So I made an app called Happy Appy, and it's free. It's free to the world, it's free forever. And basically what it does is every single day it sends a video to your mobile device that will make you happy. And so um, what I do is I call YouTube for videos that are never rude, crude, or nude, which is my motto. Um, they're all videos that are under four minutes. They're all videos that will make you smile. So, um, and, I, and I can go into iTunes Connect every morning when I wake up. So I'll wake up in the morning, go into iTunes Connect, and I can see how many downloads I had from the day before and where those downloads came from. So this morning I go in, I'm like, oh look, like nine people in Germany were happy yesterday because of me. And six people in Bulgaria, and two people in Poland, and you know, 12 people in Israel, and 90 people in the US. I'm like, I made all those people happy yesterday. That is so cool. So every single day you just load this video onto your phone, and you watch a video that makes you happy. So once you've loaded it, just you just touch the button every day. There's also an alarm feature so that you can wake up happy every day, which is nice. So instead of watching the negative news that is right. most of our world, 
you can watch a happy video to make you smile. So this morning's, for example, is really cute. The, the one today was, um, it's this lion who has befriended a little dachshund dog. And they literally, like the dog, this little tiny sausage wiener dog, goes, like hangs out with this lion in this wildlife park and cleans his teeth every day. It's the cutest really? thing. So it just makes you happy. Yeah. So that's been really fun. So each day now, I'll get up, I make my daughter lunch. I'm like big into that whole mommy. I still do it as long as I possibly can. I know like there have been moments in my life when my kids were younger, I was like, no, don't make me make another lunch. Now I love it because I only have one at home. I've only got another year after this to make her her nice little healthy lunch. So I make her lunch in the mornings and, um, and then I typically do yoga. I do meditate at least a half an hour a day. It's been a really important part of my healing. So I do some meditation. Um, this morning was a gorgeous day. My daughter's home from college, so I did some outside time, walked a couple miles, and then I retired to my office where I'll either spend time um, looking for more happy videos, which is wonderful. Um, it's a pretty fun job. I've got um, parent-teacher conferences this afternoon for my daughter Sierra, so I still do some of the mommy stuff. And then I'm in the midst of another startup, which is Baby Bites, I talked about a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm working on some um, material for Baby Bites right now, which are some really fun books that I'm doing for children. Um, again, sort of the under three crowd. But I have these beautiful characters that I've developed. So they're all bird characters. And to give you an idea, and it'll give you a sense of what the books will be about, I've got characters like, um, Leonardo da Vinci, who's a little finch. You're and really got, good at naming. You're, you're <laughs> yeah, I love these. I've got um, Emily Chickenson, who's a poet. I've got Jane Austen, who's a chicken, who does stories. I've got um, Charles Chickens, who also writes stories for his family of his ten little chicks. The real Charles Dickens did have ten children. Yeah. Um, I have... Um, oh, they're so cute. I'm trying to, like, off the top of my head. Let's see, I said Marco Pollo. I've got um, Edgar Allan Crow. I've just got this whole lovely cast Great. of characters. So I'm working on some books for them right now. So I work at home. Um, I'm actually on my way to Minneapolis this afternoon. I have a meeting there with Target tomorrow to talk to them about bringing Baby Bites into their stores and see what happens there. So still that. involved in work, and but trying to remember to take time to be healthy because yeah. Of course, that's become a really big priority for me. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Julie, I have one yeah. last question for you. But before I ask it, tell people where can they find out more about My Happy Appy, Baby Bites, where should they, what site should they check out? Thank you for reminding me to say that. So um, my own website is www.mommymade.com. It's a great name happy, also. You can find info there. Yeah, you can find info there about Happy Happy. But if you're just hearing this and you're like, oh, I want to get that on my phone right away, which of course you should, um, just search in the App Store for Happy and then Space Happy, A-P-P-Y. Okay. And um, yeah, so that's good. And you're the best medicine also. You are the best medicine, yep, dot com, which also, if you just go to Mommy Made, it'll we'll have, have all, all, all those different okay. things. Yeah. And I'll, link, just speaking. I'll link so, all those up too. Yeah. Thank you. Also, um, my last question is about your daughters. They're so important to you, and they see their mom, you know, with tons of success and business in life. What do they want to? What do they aspire to do? Yeah, you know, it's really cool. Um, both of my girls are arts kids. Um, my daughter Aspen is actually finishing her second novel. Wow. She's nineteen. Just turned nineteen. Um, so she's working on publishing right now and publishing that. She's in college, and her major is, um, I always have a hard time remembering what this is called. It's so crazy. It's called Emerging Digital Technology. So she is really interested in stories behind video games. So she is really curious about how video game design works and doing the kind of writing that goes into those games. My younger daughter is definitely going into video game design. Both of my girls are game design nerds, like they're kind of those gaming kids. And it's a pretty cool field to be in if you're a female. Because we've been touring some of these schools, in fact we're touring the Ringling School of Art and Design on Monday in Florida. Um, because you go into these programs to, to check them out, and it's almost, it's so male dominated right now 
that it's fantastic, not only from a career perspective for them to look into that, but it's great to get a female perspective behind these sorts of games. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of girls don't want to play combat games. They want to play different sorts of games that are maybe more story involved and creative involved. So I think they'll be great inspired um, people who work in that field. And my daughter asked, and I have to say, my older daughter, she's also working on the Facebook page for the Baby Bites characters. Okay. So she's getting involved. And That's great. I have to share because this was like one of those things. I'm going to just read you this because it's really cool. Yesterday I was um, out running around and my daughter sent me this text. I'm just going to read it to you because it was the great, yeah. it was like one of those great moments. She wrote, It's so cool to see commercials for educational baby toys and books and stuff and know that it was your idea that inspired all of it. You are so cool. I was like, <laughs> Oh my God, there's my Christmas present, like all wrapped up in three sentences. That was just like one of those moments that he was so proud. I yeah. was so happy. So, well, so yeah. thank you so much for sharing. I want to be the first one to thank you. This means a lot. And I'm, I know everyone got a lot out of this. So I really thank appreciate you. your time on that. Thank you so much. Nice Thanks. to meet you. You person. too.